I'd like to introduce now um, Maria Ressa. As you know, Maria has been the vision and the inspiration behind Rappler.com. Maria is the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Editor of Rappler. Folks, let's welcome Maria with a big hand, big round of applause. Good morning. First of all, thank you very much for all of you guys coming. So many of you were here so early, and I know that you drove hours to come here. Um, it took us also a while to come to you. Uh, many of the Rappler team traveled for 10 hours, strangely because the flights landing directly in Tacloban are very few. So they traveled in through Cebu. We're thrilled to be here nearly a year later, and I'm looking forward to hearing all your comments and thoughts. We're very proud to bring together some former colleagues of mine and the Global Center of Journalism to give you other thoughts about journalism. We're learning as much being here as I, we hope you will about journalism and where it's headed. I will only start with something that I will ask you to imagine with me, which is what will journalism look like when you are my age? I'm older than I look, huh? Um, <laughs> I am, I was probably, in fact, okay. So if you're a student now, it means that I was already a journalist before you were born. So that's how old I am. Don't think about that anymore. Um, so let's imagine, hashtag 2030 now, and come with me on this and tweet. I see your phones. Tweet because we want to grab the conversation away from overnight. It's been in the United States. It's in New York. Now let's bring it to Tacloban. Where will we be 2030 now? In 2030. So let me show you where we start. Uh, and I will actually show it to you through my life since now you have an idea how old I am and how long I've been a journalist before you were born. Uh, let, let me start with this. When I started being a journalist, I used this, pen and paper. And I still do today because unlike you, I don't like the gadgets as much as you do, even though I've learned to use it. And I had to run. If I was in this room reporting it, I had to run to find a payphone to tell my editor what it is that's happening here. Imagine how much things have changed. Then. This is the first typewriter I typed on when I first came to the Philippines in 1986. Wrist action to, diba? Medyo ano? Mabilis ba kayong mag-type sa ganito? <laughs> na try yun na. Very hard. Um, then, computer. Right? The first computers that happened. So look at the way technology has changed the way me. I'm just one person, the way I do my job, right? The computers. Then after computers, there was this magic thing called the fax. Uh, it was amazing. In my 20s, it was around 1987, CNN, we bought a fax. And it was wonderful that I could print something. My editor will get it in New York. He'll make changes and then send it back. And it's there. It's magic from New York or from Atlanta, from wherever he is. Then this happened. Easy Call. Um, do you guys remember these names? What's the other one? Easy Call and Pocket Bell. The teachers, samahan nyo naman ako, teachers, because <laughs> the students won't remember it. So pocket belt, easy call, magical din siya, ha? Um, imagine you carry this around, it beeps, and then you have to go find a phone, dial a number, tell them the number that's on your pager so that they can dictate to you what was on your message, and then you dictate another number, and then you dictate your message. Imagine all the different steps, right? Ngayon magte-text lang kayo. You just text and it's there. Then there was this. You have your cell phones now. But if you have a cell phone, if my the iPhone that that you have has more computing power than the largest supercomputer that took city blocks in New York City in the mid 80s. It's an incredible time, the things that you have, right? 
that's just the beginning of my career. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't, that's only, imagine how fast that is now. What does that mean for the journalism work that we do? As the technology changes, the way we do our work changes, and while I'm envious of you, because right now, look, you're already reporting, snap, then you, you can actually post it, right? There are other things that happened, and I'll show it to you through my life again, right? Andame, pero ganito na lang siya. There's lots here. So I remember here, this is when we would go away for a week, two weeks at a time, and no one can reach you because you're, in, you're inside a war zone or you're inside a place where you can't reach them. Two weeks. Sometimes I'd be gone for two weeks and you know, my, my, I would tell my parents because they'd be very worried. But, but I would come out with a story and there would be the story. So that's why it's black and white because it's old. Na siya. Uh, then what happened? Satellite technology which is actually what we're using for broadband here right now, right? So satellite technology happened, but it's expensive. And that's what we started doing. So at the beginning with CNN, a satellite feed from Manila would cost thousands of dollars for a 10 minute live. So we would only do it once every 12 hours. And then it got cheaper. So it became, oh well, only $5,000 for 10 minutes. So we would do it once every six hours to do the live reports. I had very strange live reports. But then something else happened. What's the next step? This one here, we're standing on the roof of a cargo container in East Timor and everything was destroyed. There was no electricity. There, was no phone, there were no phones, but we're transmitting live on something CNN called digital news gathering. A small little satellite we carried on our own, which meant we could go live anywhere. And here's the hard part. We could go live every hour. If you can go live every hour, how much time do we have to talk to you? So the reporting time went from two weeks to 20 minutes. That's how much time I had to go gather the report before I had to go back to the live shot location to tell you the report. Big change, right? So at a certain point, after almost 20 years, I got tired of doing breaking news and I decided to come home. And I headed ABS-CBN, a thousand journalists, and here's the next big step, the next big change when you became journalists. You're growing up at a time when you're automatically a publisher because of your social media accounts and you are a journalist. So what did we do? In ABS, you remember we, in 2005, we embraced the citizen journalists just a little bit ahead of others. There was a big debate. Why would we professional journalists work with citizen journalists? It was a horribly outdated debate because now there is no option. You are the first journalist. So hopefully the rest of the day you can talk and find out the discipline of journalism as you spread it on your social media accounts. So then we go back. Here's the hard part. It's changing so fast that even the traditional journalists don't know what to do. It's not that they don't know what to do, it's that maybe we don't want to change as fast as the 20-somethings, as much as you're pushing us to change, right? So what did we do? In 2012, about two and a half, a little more than two and a half years ago, I decided it's much easier to start with nothing than it is to take a big, big group and change that group. This is your advantage. If you're like us, a very young group, it's easier to be creative and to be flexible when you start with nothing, right? Campus journalists, look at the things you can do with things like this. So what did we do? We changed the way offices are set up. Traditional journalists tend to say, you're graphics, so dun ka lang. you're on that side. You're only a cameraman, so you're not going to sit with the coders. We decided we're going to open it up. Sama-sama tayo. 
We're all going to sit together and we're going, everyone will know what everyone else is doing. And we changed it. How many people here have a Facebook account? Raise your hand. Very good. How many people have a Twitter account? Okay. Very good. Philippines, Facebook, 94% of Filipinos on the internet have it. Stacy will share more stats with you. But then what we did is we decided social media is important to us because that's the first step. Up until that point, traditional journalists used to think of social media as a distraction. We decided you were very important. So then we did things like this. This is one of our first reporters. Rappler started with 12 people. And then, if you look at what she has, what we did is we decided the phone is going to be a very important tool. Because when, like, when I got up on stage, I saw you taking photos and you were already tweeting and, and posting on Facebook, right? So what she has is we decided to build a case for the iPhone. This is, now you can buy this off the shelf, but in 2012, we had to build it. So we built a case for the iPhone. We pulled a lens on it so that it's in between um, amateur and professional. It's plugged into professional audio. She carries her light here and her tripod here. The job that was done by four people is now done by one. Medjo Mahirap, you're smiling because you're going to do this. <laughs> you know, you're, um, and then here's the last part. When you do that, be prepared that people will laugh. <laughs> Ayi Makaraig was a former ANC producer. Sige, tayo kayo kung gusto nyo makita. Kasi, ano, right? So, she's a former producer. She became one of our first reporters. Here she is talking to herself. That's her, she's shooting her stand-up, right? These are our former cameramen from ABS. And the picture was taken by Cesc Drillon, our anchor at ABS, right? Pinagtatawanan siya. She's alone talking to her iPhone. But you know what? That piece was posted immediately, faster. So what you're doing here will be posted faster than the news group can get in a car, travel to the station, turn the video to something that they can post, right? Or air. It's faster. This is where we, oh, I, you can build things. Again, because it's completely a new time, right? This is something that was the brainchild of Rupert Ambil. Rupert is from Leyte. He's from Eastern Samar. And you know, there's a team that traveled from Eastern Samar. I, sorry, he's from, okay. Samar, not Leyte, sorry. <laughs> so he's, he decided that we're going to build our own broadcast van. Um, so you know the difference in cost, right? A broadcast satellite van, if you were to buy it from the States, will cost you $1 million. $1 million. And we bought several of these for ABS, but Little Rappler with 12 people cannot afford $1 million. So this one we built from scratch. You can build it, and it only cost 100,000 pes pesos, pesos, 100,000, sorry, $100,000, $100,000. So minus 10, it's, it's one-tenth of the cost. What does that do? It gives you a switcher, it gives you the, the kind of electric facilities you need, it gives you the ability to broadcast anywhere, but more than anything, this is an IP satellite van, which means that when it was here in Tacloban, it not only had excess capacity to let the people continue to charge their phones or their f one, one family was charging um, something they needed for asthma on it, but it could also give broadband over the area. It gives internet so you can connect and tell people you were alive, that you can connect to your families. It's cheaper to be creative and you can find solutions. This is where we are today. I now walk out of the, the, the internet. Um, our, very, our team is there. This is when we did elections. And we combine 
This is the time you combine things, right? You combine, have fun, be creative. And what happened in a year and a half? We actually wound up becoming the third top online news site in the Philippines. This is Alexa. You can look online. You can check it. Uh, the top online site right now is Inquirer, followed by ABS, CBNnews.com, and the third is Rappler. Interesting din yan, di ba? In Inquirer is print, ABS is TV, and Rappler is purely, the only purely online and mobile play. That's where the world is headed. But I'm biased, so you have to ask someone else, right? Um, so what's Rappler? Uh, it's still us, professional journalism. And again, my colleagues, my former colleagues and GCJD will talk to you more about what professional journalism is. But it's changed. We move from the world of authority to the world of authenticity. And then we add this, technology. What's, what is that? I'll show you some of that a little bit later. And then we add you. You are the magic in the mix. Because you now make it completely circular, right? And this is where Rappler is. And this content creation is amplified on social media. That's how we connect to you. When we can connect with you, we can ask you to act. And you do act, and thank you for that. That's called crowdsourcing, right? Crowdsourcing is when all of us take one small step to do something that one of us could never do alone. Wikipedia is crowdsourced encyclopedia, 2.5 million pages written by everyone around the world. It's self-correcting. It's pretty incredible crowdsourcing, and I'll show you some examples of that. And finally, if you have crowdsourcing, you have big data. Magiging geeky ako dito. Big data, I'll show you what that means very quickly. This is an example of the easy crowdsourcing on Rappler. And if you've seen Rappler, you know that we have every story has a mood meter. You click how you feel. When you click how you feel, it's aggregated by the mood navigator, which crowdsources every 24 hours, it crowdsources the mood of the day. Why moods? Because the studies show us that up to 80% of how we human beings make decisions in our lives is not based on what we think. It's based on how we feel. And that's one of the things we need to acknowledge, right? How we feel is very important. And so if how you feel, well, here's, here's another statistic why it's really important. Because Gallup in November last year said that the Philippines is the most emotional country in the world. Singapore is the least emotional. <laughs> um, so we crowdsource the mood of the day. What else can you do when those are data points? Think about them as data points. You can look at the month in moods. So this is May 2013 in moods. And we look at that, why? Because of elections, right? So the month of May was 77% happy. Election day itself, which is here, you, it's cut off a little bit, but on election day, we were very happy leading up to election day. And then on election day, Pinoy's got angry and annoyed. And that angry and annoyed began coming at 8.30 in the evening after the polls closed and the, res the results of the votes came in slowly. Now, as you go down, this big one is when the senators, the winners, were announced. And then if you go down further, this big spike in red, you won't remember it, but that was Vice Ganda making a joke about Jessica Soho and rape. People were angry, right? So, what do you do with that? That then can become big data. So when you vote on the mood meter, that becomes a data point. Let's talk about social media and big data. Because when we go to big data, there's no bigger data than social media, right? So you guys, when you raised your hands to say you were on Facebook, Look at those stats. Uh, I've been talking, so we upload over an hour of video every second. 
On Facebook, more than 10 million photos uploaded every hour. Right? These are incredible statistics, and you are the ones making that happen, right? Sorry, hindi nyo nakikita, but feel free to stand if you want to. Ado. Um, what does that mean? I, wanna, I want you to help you think about this in a different way. Think about us as people in this room, right? We each have our own stories to tell. But what if, those are the individual tweets, what if you pull up and you see us as a whole group, right? Then you pull up even more and you can see us in Leyte Park Hotel. The view we are after when you're talking about big data is not the individual, but the big pattern. And I'll show you what I mean by showing it to you visually. Imagine we're at Leyte Park Hotel and we're going out to take a look at where big data is. So you go up, 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 and you start to see this whole continent. Well, the country. <laughs> you see Visayas, you see Luzon. Then you begin to see, oh, you see the whole country. You see the whole globe. You see the world in context, right? That world in context is what big data allows you to see. What do I mean by that? I'm going to be specific. They're not Rorschach tests, and these are psychological tests. These are actually your Twitter maps, your behavior, human behavior on Twitter. This is what convinced me that it was time to do Rappler. Hashtag Japan. This is the way the Japanese behaved during the earthquake and the Fukushima reactor, right? And the Japanese behaved the way Filipinos behaved during Sendong, during Ondoy, during Yolanda. But we couldn't have mapped the tweets in Yolanda because we well, communications, diba? Right? But what, how do we human beings behave during crisis? We form hubs around sources of information. And normally, they're news or government. And that's what happened here. This is the way millions of Americans behaved during the last presidential elections. This is, we pulled down hashtag GOP, that mean, that's for the Republican Party. When you pull that down, the individual tweets show you a visualization of how divided Americans were between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, right? You, it's not a survey, that's real human behavior. Hashtag Egypt, that is what a revolution looks like. Hashtag Syria, this is 18 months into the rebellion, the, the clash between President Bashar al-Assad and the rebels, this is what it looks like. But interesting, right? What if this begins to look like that? Does that mean there's a revolution? These are just some of the questions you can have when you're dealing with big data. Is there, can you predict what we will do based on the way we behave, right? So let's go to the Philippines. Of course we must go to the Philippines. Do you remember this? Hashtag million people march, Luneta. Hashtag million people march. Now you actually also had in Tacloban, there was a, a rally in Tacloban, but in Manila, it took seven days for one Facebook post to get 100,000 to 150,000 people in Luneta Park about corruption, right? To get this many people out. Here's the funny thing. Remember, this is an internet-driven protest, probably our first social media-driven one. And if that's the case, magulusha, it's a little bit chaotic, right? So what does that mean? If you were actually here, and some of our reporters were here, when you walk around, it's kind of boring. Because you walk around in Luneta Park and there was no central program, everyone was doing their own thing. When you map it, it looks like this. Chaotic, right? It's chaotic, but here's the other part. This, like the map of Egypt, two years before that revolution I showed you. So two years before that map was exactly what this looked like. And you know what happened? 
that students in Egypt, and, and Shahira Amin will talk to you in Egypt, the students in Egypt and other groups, including Shahira, began to structure the narrative. They began to tell stories that built their communities and pushed their communities to action. That's why that became like that. You began to see discrete groups. Tayo, in the Philippines, this chaos gives us purpose. We need to structure the narrative, and then we have to figure out where we want our communities to go. That's the data. Now, I'll end with this. I want to show you your communities. There are two last things. Let me, we have a product we call Reach. It's a data analytics tool Rappler's been working on that puts a lot of these things in, in focus. This is the map before we began. So this was at about 9 o'clock, half an hour before. The hashtag we're using, are you tweeting? You guys better be tweeting because we're going to do a real-time map after I show you this. Hashtag 2030 now. When you go here, uh, LinkedIn is the most influential account. Why? Because they've been having a conversation in the States while we were sleeping. Who's LinkedIn connected to? Click. Pete Cashmore. Anyone here know who Pete Cashmore is? Pete Cashmore was the guy who started Mashable, right? Who's he connected to? The, yeah, let's go here. Of course, Mashable Social Good. You can see it based on his, right? Now, I want to look at where we are in this conversation because we've started joining hashtag 2030 now. We've got to be in the perimeter. Can, who's this? Can we check here? Who's that? Okay, Goody Awards. That's still in the United States. Uh, we've got, we'll probably be... Try this one, yeah, or that one. Go ahead, try that one. Okay, we're there in the periphery. This is before we began, right? And let me see who, what, who's in our periphery. Who's this? I know he's here. Stand up, Jed Cortez. Oh, <laughs> so finally we found a connection. To, uh, okay, let's do. Let's start a new, let's, let's trace it right now. Let's graph hashtag 2030 now. And let's, so it'll take a little while to render the graph. Were you tweeting? I'll know, I'll see it. <laughs> were you tweeting? If you were tweeting, then we'll hopefully have pulled some of the conversation to me. Oh, wow, so, sorry, ako pala. You were tweeting about me, right? You must have been, using my hashtag, which is why you just made me really influential. Thank you. <laughs> um, but let me see who's here. Who's this? <laughs> see, Jed Cortez again. The power of social media. Sino to? Campus join? Okay, and who's this? Okay, Rappler, Rappler, Jed is beating you. What's up with you, Rappler? <laughs> uh, she says it's the internet. Jed is doing okay. Let's pull it out. Let's see who else is in our perimeter. Okay, who's this? What's this account? Plus social good. That's based in New York, but that kind of makes sense because I'm one of the plus social good ambassadors. There are five global ambassadors. There's one in the Philippines, one in Nigeria, one in Paris, one in Brazil, one in the United States. That's how we divided the world. Um, okay, so this is kind of moving to the States. Let's look here. Who's that? And we go back to Mashable. So you're starting to see how, please, let's grab the conversation away from them and show what Filipinos can do. We normally beat, starting in 2010, Comscore called the Philippines the social media capital of the world. And you 20-somethings, you keep changing the world and exhausting me. <laughs> I wish it would stop a little while. But you can see how we're all connected. There is no better visualization than this, than social media, than what you already do. You can, may still be a student now, but you already have tremendous power. Power I didn't have when I was your age. 
Hopefully for the rest of the day, you'll understand the framework for how you can use that power. Some of the discipline a journalist brings to it, you become a journalist. And here's why. Because you are trusted by your family and friends. In fact, your family and friends trust you more than they trust media. So you don't want to take your family and friends down the wrong path, right? That's what the power of journalism can do coupled with technology. That is our world coming up. It is an amazing world. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Maria. That was a very fascinating thing to see, right? You see your tweets and how you're connected to each other. That's a great thing about um, data uh, that, that you can visualize.